So we started with a couple of classes, um, and we had some really cool ideas for, um, for class mechanics that would be specific to those classes. Um, and it proved to be very compelling, not just in terms of the gameplay of the class, but also you know, if you're playing uh, a barbarian and then you, maybe you're, you're grouped up with a sorceress and the sorceress is using her class mechanic, it, it really, you look at that and you're like, oh, well that, there's lots of really interesting gameplay there that I could check out, you know, in the future, maybe on a future season or, or something like that. And so we really wanted the classes to shine in their own ways and differentiate from each other. And then also it goes back to that aspect of choice. Like when we, when we look at the class mechanics, we try to uh, design them in ways that increase the, the number of meaningful choices and ways that you can customize your character. So if you look at the Necromancer, for example, right, the Book of the Dead allows uh, for players who, you know, the Necromancer is a core part of Diablo as a franchise, right? It, it's uh, this, this really cool summoner class that ends up being really fundamental to gameplay. You can approach monsters in a totally different way with all of your minions, like getting in the way of projectiles, tanking monsters. You get this really cool fantasy of being this sort of general of the dead. But there are lots of different ways that people have played Necromancers in the, the, the franchise, right? You've got people who enjoyed playing Necromancers in Diablo 2, where they're kind of overseeing the battlefield and their minions are, are doing all of the, the combat. You've got this is a more action-packed Necromancer of Diablo 3, where you're like really manip you're really uh, sort of commanding your minions more directly. And you've got uh, players as well who want to play um, this sort of dark caster fantasy, but aren't necessarily attached to the army aspect of it, even though that's the, the, uh, a big draw of the Necromancer. I mean, corpse explosion is cool, just in general. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And who doesn't want to explode corpses, right? <laughs> So when you look at the, the class mechanics, we designed Book of the Dead to allow players to customize their necromancer to speak to that class fantasy. So you can do things like sacrifice your minions. Um, you can adjust which ones, like I really want to have a golem, uh, but I don't want to have skeletons. I want to have skeletons, but not a golem. I want to have the biggest army I can. And there are trade-offs and interesting choices that can be made all through that. And it's interesting that it's like, to me, it's around adding depth without trying to add too much complexity. You know, you look at the Sorceress one with the enchantment system, it's incredibly powerful to have the ability for different skills fire based on what you're doing, whether it's like you're bringing down a blizzard every 10 seconds or your certain lightning is coming out of you or those sorts of things, but they're kind of, in a way, a passive ability. I don't have to trigger it. It's triggering based on either a condition or based on time. And similar to, um, the Necromancer's Book of the Dead is allowing you to customize and configure your army. It's not adding complexity necessarily to, oh, I have to worry about how I control differently. And so it makes things richer and more customizable because now even if I'm a fire sorceress and you're a fire sorceress, the fact that what we put into our chance slots could make it very different in how we play and how we build on, upon that. And gives me it gives us access to like a two, couple more skills, which normally you'd be limited by your skill bar. And so that notion of that each class has a way to go deeper into the class fantasy and do it in a way that doesn't mean like, oh, now I have six more buttons I have to press or whatever, like it keeps it deep and interesting and, and custom without overwhelming you. The skill trees have evolved uh, dramatically over the course of development, I would say. We're on number four? Many now. iterations. <laughs> and a lot of it has come, you know, one of our, our strategies here has been to like really share uh, as much as we can with the fans as often as we can. So we've gone out with uh, and talked about like, here's where our skill trees are uh, in our, you know, in very like our log updates and like when we go to show, show off the game. Um, and we've gotten lots of feedback, feedback like there are, I want to have more choices or, you know, I want to have lots of other options. And so out of that have come like a number of revisions to the skill tree, both for um, making it clear uh, how you can progress through it, making it work for new players, um, and um, ways to increase the depth. Um, and that's where we get into the Paragon system, you know, which comes online uh, as you get, as you level up and get into the higher levels. And we've really tried to hit that 
a sweet spot where we're providing all of the opportunity for choice um, while not overwhelming players who you know, are looking at this big map of skills and, and you know, asking where to start, right? I, I love theory crafting. Like I, that's one of the things that draws me to these types of games is how do I make a build? How do I set up skills? How do I make things work together? And you want a lot of depth there so that you have a lot of choice so we're not just making the same build all the time. Like we're both fire sorceresses and we know exactly what skills we're using. And, and so you want enough choice there that you can kind of customize it, make it feel unique to yourself, but not, I don't, there's games where you would go into it and you go like, oh, that's way too complicated. Just go look up a website. Tell me what I have to put in. I'm just, I'll print, you know, the old days when I'm old enough, I used to print it out and bring it to my thing and go like, okay, put a node here, put a node there, you know, and I was just making somebody else's build because the, the way you made a build was so complicated. I couldn't feel like I could own the theory crafting. And, and that's, I think, a line that we've been walking is trying to make sure that you have lots of choices, both active and passive skills that, but is still sort of grokkable that you can go and theory craft yourself and you can still create your own build. And I think as a player, like when I first came to the D4 skill tree, I really, I felt that notion of that, what I talked about with the equation of that progression of D2 is, I really feel the D2 skill tree, that notion of inherited, you know, there's an inheritance there from skill to skill that you can take certain skills that impact other skills and so you can kind of build on top of them the way that you used to be able to do in, uh, in D2 and so, I think that's really that notion of that the richness of the progression that was in D2. I feel that richness in D4. You talked about skills, connecting to other skills and building off of them. Um, that's another area where we've gone through a lot of iteration, right, to um, make those connections clear. Because you don't have this, the connection where you know, a skill is literally below this other skill and you must take right. one point in this and then you, that you saw in D2 but you have all of these sort of uh, natural connections between things like the skill of causes bleeding and the skill benefits from bleeding. And right. so we've built this uh, skill tag system, we've authored this ability to search the skill tags, so you can highlight nodes that are related to that, and so you can sort of see how these things are interconnected and mm -hmm. sort of assist the player in like, oh, it's a, there's some really cool interactions here to check out. Yeah, give me all the skills that have bleeding in it, and, you know, or would benefit bleeding, and then you go, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't know that one was gonna help it. Um, so you can respec point by point, you can in, directly in the skill tree for gold. And that gold uh, cost ramps up uh, at some rate as you level up. So as you under, like more clearly define your build and like get more things that are, that are associated with it and supporting it, it becomes a little bit more expensive to respec, but still doable. Um, so those choices have, have meaning. Mm -hmm. And at the early part of the game, it's very, very, um, uh, it's a very small gold cost, so you feel like, oh, like, I'm going to try this skill. Like, oh, I didn't like that skill. I'm going to try this skill. Or like, oh, that skill looks exciting. Let me try this, right? And you can go back and forth really freely. And you can also do uh, uh, full respec uh, at any point as well. So, you know, a lot of the, as you build out the skill tree, you have things that unlock based on other nodes that you've chosen. Um, so we spent some time um, making that as smooth as possible and that's where we ended up in the skill tree itself like you're you know press one button to to, to buy a skill and the other button to refund that skill so you really are just in that tree like adjusting where all your points are and you don't have to like jump out and and um go to some other menu that's one of the things that's really different between d3 and d4 is like d3 once you get to a certain place you the difference between one build to another is like i gotta go change my clothes you know, because you're really focused on being set based or um, very equipment based so that it, your build is kind of defined by your equipment more than anything else. So you're like, oh, I want to change from fire to ice. Let me go change my clothes real quick. Right. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a very clear way of doing it, the kind of paper doll model. But one of the goals, the design goals, not to speak for Joe, but like one of the design goals is really to make the your build feel inherent to your character. And that's one of the things about the, uh, the gold cost going up over time is that basically get you get there's going to be a point in time where um, I'll make up a number, but like say at level 50, there's going to be a point in time where you go like, oh, I would like to be a different barbarian, but it's too expensive to undo everything I've done. It's actually better for me to roll another barbarian and start a new one and go fresh. Um, and we wanted that, that notion that like with each level you progress down a character, you're kind of becoming more and more attached to it and, and getting more and more sort of settled with it so that you're not just going, okay, I'm level 65 and now I'm just gonna change my clothes and become a completely different barbarian, you know? So 
cheap in the beginning, so lots of experimentation. Do I like fire? Do I like ice? Do I like lightning? Yes, no, turn it off. And I also love the fact that you can get skills through equipment that you can access the skills before maybe you would be even be able to from a level perspective and go, oh, I, I picked up this skill on my sword or my boots and I'm going to go try it out and see if I like it or not. Um, so I love that ability to go in and buy a skill and, and feel no regret and paying for it to, to with, with in-game gold to, to get rid of it. Um, but then, wow, I got, you know, once you get up there, you know, you're level 90, you're going like, uh, I think I'm just going to, you know, I, I think I'm not going to try to undo, spend a, a million, whatever it's going to be to undo all these skills. So I, I love that sort of sense of, I don't know, hardening cement. It's like over time, you know, there's a sense of permanence that starts to happen the further, deeper you go into that character.